uh, as we get going, I'd just like to start by doing an acknowledgement of country. And of course, it's a very special week this week. And so I'll acknowledge all of that. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on never ceded land and pay my respects to the custodians of this beautiful saltwater country where I am, which is just north of the Hawkesbury River. Um, and remind us that this week we're celebrating NAIDOC week. And I acknowledge that this country on which I live and work from and all the different nations that you are zooming in from always was and always will be Aboriginal lands and waterways. Um, so this week, as we celebrate through NAIDOC Week, the diverse cultures of the many nations of this land, I also want to acknowledge that we are remembering our difficult shared history and the ongoing and unreconciled impacts and trauma of invasion and colonisation. And I'd like to acknowledge Aboriginal colleagues in the room with us today and, and in our team and across the university and pay my respects to elders past, present and those who will lead us into the future. I also wanted to mention that today is also Remembrance Day. Um, and as we commemorate the sacrifice of those who served and died in armed conflicts, I particularly pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander service men and women who fought then and have continued to give their service to defend this country that in so many ways has failed to acknowledge their sacrifices. And I also acknowledge that there has never been similar recognition for, of the sacrifices and massacres of the many Aboriginal people who def died defending their own countries and nations. And I look forward to the day when we as a country can move beyond contention and, and division and properly commemorate and pay respects to those who gave their service and lives in all conflicts. So a big week and lots to commemorate, recognise and remember. Um, and here we are in uh, the, on, at the fourth panel for the um, CCLP program. And it just gives me great pleasure to welcome the panel and we'll go around and have introductions in a minute. Um, so this week, as you know, we're looking at um, organisational cult cultural competence. How do we embed cultural competence across our organisation? wherever it is that we work. Um, and so I will just um, quickly introduce everybody and then I'll go around and individually ask um, our panelists to tell us a bit about themselves and, and their, where they're coming from and their understanding of cultural competence. So um, I'll go around my screen, you know, as you do. Um, so upper left corner is Demetria Grutis um, and she is of course here at the university. Um, she's an associate professor in work and organizational studies in the Sydney Business School. Um, and she's a leading scholar in the field of migration, labour, mobility and cultural diversity in the business context. To my right, I've got Suzanne Colbert, who is the founding CEO of the Australian Network on Disability, which is a not-for-profit organisation that supports over 290 private, public and third sector businesses to build their disability confidence. And the third one of the group is Manisha Amin, who is, I love this title, I have to say Manisha, I want it, I have to talk to Jennifer, my director, about changing my title. Manisha is a Chief Strategist and Visionary at Centre for Inclusive Design. Don't we all want to be a visionary? Um, and I'm also impressed with your, um, title, your PhD on Communication and Social Inquiry, it sounds fascinating. Um, so welcome to you all, um, and if I could just ask you all to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your perspective on cultural competence and, and just to sort of identify where you're coming from. If we could start with Demetria. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm zooming in from Gadigal land and in this context um, throughout this year, I've, I've often reflected on the various lands that we zoom in from um, and that we're connected by the longest continuing uh, history. Uh, this land is and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I, I really do embody my research. I identify as a culturally diverse woman. I have uh, been conducting research on, um, as Gabrielle mentioned, on um, overseas trained workers, migrants, culturally diverse workers for about two decades now. And within that, I've also been looking at cultural competence as a key dimension of understanding uh, cultural diversity at the workplace level. My focus is invariably on that workplace level. Um, I'm passionate about looking at uh, cultural diversity through a critical lens and, and really understanding, I suppose, 
um, the, the social justice and human rights approach to how we understand what cultural diversity is. And obviously it's, it's, it's it, the underpinnings of this scholarship is, is what um, informs cultural competence. Uh, so I'll leave it at that because I could continue talking for the next hour, as I mentioned to Gabrielle, it's a bit of a worry with me. You'll have to shut me down because I do tend to get really excited about this topic. So our, it our makes it easier for me not to have to keep coming, thinking of new <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thanks, Dimitri. We'll come back to that and because um, we also take such a social justice approach to cultural competence as well. So um, Suzanne. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, I too am on Gadigal land and pay my respect to elders past, present and leaders emerging and, um, and uh, acknowledge that we, uh, it's Remembrance Day today um, and the sacrifice of so many. So about um, me and my, uh, my um, organisation, so the Australian Network on Disability was born just over 20 years ago uh, when we realised that um, assisting people with disability to get and keep award wage jobs was relatively straightforward. Convincing employers that people with disability were terrific employees and had skills and capabilities um, that suited their organisations has been a longer journey. And so the purpose of the Australian Network on Disability is to help large complex organisations to be able to be disability confident and to be barrier free to people with disability. And ultimately what we hope is that organisations routinely anticipate and seamlessly accommodate difference uh, related to, well, any kind of difference uh, really. But that means that organisations have to have the behaviours, the attitudes, the systems and the knowledge to know how to welcome people with disability. Thank you. That's great. And it's really succinct. I'm taking notes because I'm I should be um, putting out something like that. And um, very in line as well with how the National Centre um, approaches cultural competence. And Manisha. <coughs> I always struggle with that mute, unmute button. So, um, but thank you so much for having me here. My name is Manisha and I work at the Centre for Inclusive Design. So what we look at is how design works. Um, and how design doesn't work. And um, a lot of what we do really comes from our brothers and sisters who are Torres Strait Islanders, uh, sorry, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, and their notions of inclusion as well as exclusion. And I'd really like to acknowledge leaders past, present and emerging on this amazing land that I'm on here, um, which is Gadigal land. And also really recognise the impact I've had by my migration. No, so I'm really lucky to be able to live in this incredible country with incredible freedoms um, because of the blood of other people um, and the trauma that that has caused as well. Um, when we talk about cultural com um, competence and, and when we talk about culture, I always like to start by telling you a little bit about me and myself. So I am of Indian descent. I was born in a place called Parapur, which is a place in India, but I've never lived there. I was actually, I was actually born in Kenya in Africa. So I'm third generation East African Indian. And um, the first time I heard about um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people was actually this little booklet that we got in the 70s when we wanted to migrate to Australia. It was the Welcome to Australia booklet. And on the front was a picture of this dark man with white paint on his face doing what I now know as shake a leg. And when I came to Australia, I thought that's what I would be walking into. Um, so it was quite a shock for me to go to my first school and realise that for the first time in my life, as a person of six years old, I was in a community which was predominantly not of my colour or any colour that I was used to. Um, so I guess that was my, my, the start of my journey, but certainly not the end of it. 
Thank you so much for sharing that story. And um, yeah, I think a lot of us were, I'm also an immigrant from England. And uh, likewise, when I look back at what I was taught about Australia, it was a snowy mountain scheme. And um, I have I have my geography book from when I was like 10 and I've drawn a picture of an Aboriginal person. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very stereotypical picture. So yeah, thank you for that. All right, so my next question is, um, so when you're looking, um, what do you look for from an organisation when you're talking about cultural competence? And, and I guess um, my question is, how do you know an organisation is serious? You know, what are the things that you look for um, to know that a, an organisation is really interested in properly embedding cultural competence and cultural competence from your perspectives and experience as well? Um, so we might start with um, Manisha, would you, do you want to start with this one? Sure. I think it's a really interesting question. So the first thing I look for is somebody actually asking us about cultural competence. Um, it's not something that when we started in this journey in inclusion, the first two things people would talk about are women um, and LGBT, LGBTQ plus, um, you know, and, and we need to have diversity in these areas. So diversity was the first thing that came up. So when we spoke about disability, a bit like Suzanne and said, look, um, when we're talking about the edge, people who are really struggling, it's often people um, with disability as well as these things. That was a really big and an eye opener for people. Um, in the last six months, more and more people are coming to us saying, um, can you help us with cultural competence? And I think particularly because of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, this is something that's really been, and the Me Too mo movement to a certain extent, um, it's been something that's been highlighted. Um, in terms of judging whether or not someone's really serious, the fact they come and ask us is serious enough for me. So our view is um, we start with people wherever they are on that journey. And in fact, it doesn't really matter where they are. Um, we start from that perspective and with the belief that none of us are truly culturally competent. I certainly am not. Um, with every culture and every way of thinking and being um, and even in terms of methodologies I get it wrong all the time um, so we start with that notion that we're never going to be great or perfect at this we're all learning and the second thing is that um, that everybody wants to do the right thing um, and there's there's no and everybody and I mean that from you know those people that we would not necessarily think of in that space <laughs> to those we would but everyone wants to do the right thing so we walk in with those two frames and then say well what do you want to solve and what's not working um, and and then take it from there and in um, the Centre for Inclusive Design what kind of work are you doing with people like when you you know where do you start yeah. what kind of what's the sort of thing that you're working on so often it's interesting, um, often they'll have done, uh, I know Suzanne will talk about these, but often um, they'll have done um, an inclusion or a disability inclusion index or something like that first. So they've got a map of what where they're at and then they'll come to us and say either we've had complaints, we've had a problem or we've done this work and we've got a benchmark and we know we've got some gaps. And where we come in is really how do you solve those? So how do you intentionally design to be better? And we have three key dimensions in inclusive design. The first one is recognizing um, your own diversity and your own bias, because bias is not a bad thing, it's just a thing, right? So what is your own, so if we're aware of these things, then we can actually make stronger, better, faster, happier decisions. They might not all be faster. Um, and then who are you designing with? Who are you designing? Um, who's part of your team? Who's not included? Um, Who's, who's finding this difficult? Who has to put in more energy to do this? So that's the first thing that we actually train and work with. The second thing that we work with is um, this idea of co-design and participatory design um, and accessibility. So when you're creating something, whether it's a policy, a process or a website, um, or a classroom for that matter, how are you making sure that the most people can um, access that? And how do you do that in a way that you're really embedding shared knowledge? And often people are scared to work with other people. So um, it can be everything from coding to actually um, connecting the right people together and facilitating those sessions. And the last part, which I think is the part that's often forgotten, is that 
um, comes back to um, Donella Meadows, Donatello Meadows systems thinking kind of work, that we are working in a complex adapt, um, system that's constantly changing. And so two things happen because of that. One is that we create something with good intentions that has terrible consequences that we need to then think about. So how do we kind of get be alert to those before we do those things and also that when we design for one group it has it can have positive consequences for the other if we design for the people who things aren't working for so kind of using systems theory as a lens on top of this they're the three areas then so which means you can work across any part of a business um, we tend to go in and go well what are you good at what have you got what can you handle where are your resources and then where aren't they? And we'll help backfill those areas to build the systems and skills so that you can actually do this work yourself. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That was really great. I'm writing notes as we go. So, um, And I'm also really happy that it resonates so strongly with what we go through in this leadership program, which is always reassuring. Um, so, it might, Suzanne, you might um, flow on from that. Um, so, the qu same question to you about what are you looking to do with an organisation and how do you know that they're serious? Yeah. Thanks, Gabrielle. And, and yes, I uh, concur with uh, Manisha that particularly in large complex organisations that systems are really important and working with the organisation system. So when I think about um, is an organisation serious, I think one of the things that uh, is really important to the change journey that we partner with organisation is that willingness to change systems, to make their systems inclusive of people with disability. And so I, I suppose if an organisation uh, wants to keep things pretty much the same, but maybe just recruit a few people with disability, I probably wouldn't put them in the most serious um, uh, camp. But I'm constantly surprised and, and, and uh, happily so, by um, the further and more mature organisations become on the journey towards inclusivity of people with disability in particular, that um, they really are um, willing to go deep into their systems. And so a way to go deep into the system, for example, and I'll, I'll use one of so some work that we, uh, we're doing at the moment with um, ANZ Bank, and that is that we start, um, we've got a range of members together, maybe a dozen members to develop an accessible procurement task force um, across um, ICT uh, premises and facilities, um, uh, marketing and communications and uh, recruitment and selection processes. And we found a, a tool that would help ANZ and other uh, of our members ha have an inclusive procurement system so that our members could, would not invest in software or hardware that was not going to be accessible to everybody. And so, so it's this kind of downstream um, um, approach that looks right back at the, the root cause. What are we buying and who are we buying it for? And when I see those, uh, those investments made, um, that gives me great heart. And then when um, we tell that story to other organisations and they can see the flow on business benefits of not having to retrofit or fix systems, but to just buy with everybody in mind in the first place, I really feel that's a, that's a, a great example of cultural competence um that you know can be shared with so many organizations and the other part of that is the generosity of sharing that that information so it, it really is the the system um because i'm sure everyone uh knows that uh you know the most well-intentioned uh, and kind individual cannot beat a bad system that over time the system will win um on every occasion. And so for that reason, with large organisations really developing accessible 
uh, si systems then allows those behaviours, those attitudes and knowledge to flow um, in, in a more straightforward way. And it, it's particularly important for the organisation because it's of practical um, application, but it's also symbolic that we care that everybody can use uh, this, this system. So um, it's those deep commitments that really um, uh, encourage and, and um, embolden me uh, to, to want to do more. Thank you. That's so important, highlighting the system, because as we always use a definition that talks about congruency between behaviours, attitudes and policies, but within the system, because you can't do one without the other. And if you just focus on the individual, nothing changes in the system. So thank you for that. And Demetria. Um, thank you, Gabrielle. Um, Manisha and Suzanne have made my job very easy. Um, it, for me, what, what uh, makes an organisation successful when it comes to cultural competence is uh, going beyond training. And I'm really glad that um, both Manisha and Suzanne highlighted the, the level of maturity of an organisation is really important. And training is something that raises awareness, but we need to go beyond training. As, it tends to be a sort of once off approach to building self reflection, which is really important when it comes to, to cultural competence. Um, and, and it also raises um, a, an ability to see the cues for, as Manisha mentioned, we all have bias and these cues and the ability to self reflect is a way for, for calling ourselves out in many ways and, and what we're seeing and what we're not seeing which are equally as important. And beyond that, beyond the individual level, and that multi-scalar approach, which you, you both uh, talked about, that's really key to, I suppose, dismantling those systemic barriers because it is part of those assemblages that you both mentioned. Um, becoming cultural, success in cultural competence is very much about identifying the supply chain and, and the, the, the various barriers that are part of that supply chain. So a multi-scalar approach, top down, bottom up, and a co-constructed approach, which again, you both mentioned. Um, the other thing for me, that has become a bit of an obsession over the course of the last year because it's been a project I've been working on with Diversity Council Australia where we're looking at understanding what cultural diversity is. And um, so we've spent the, the, the last year consulting with experts and also conducting focus groups, at really defining what we mean by cultural diversity, which is the, the focus of um, our project. And what we, we, we've been guided by six principles, and that is to um, recognise the, um, the unique position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and to remember that identity is key. So how I identify goes beyond my country of birth. It's not a demographic static component. Um, having simple measures, but not too simple. Um, uh, using multiple indicators. As I said, uh, country of birth is one component, but other things like language ability, for instance, cultural competence is another component, identity is another component. Um, engaging with intersectionality. And I think that this is a really important conversation that we need to have. And it's not about identity politics. It's not about um, these discussions that you know you see in, in on Sky News or Fox News, that that other extreme, it's it's really understanding that we are the sum of our parts, and that of course there is construction happening as soon as I start to speak. I'm so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> It's, it's also understanding that these amplify, these our various intersections amplify systemic barriers. And finally, benchmarks is really important. Um, and as Manisha mentioned, people tend to come to you when they've, um, I suppose, engaged with uh, an inclusion index. So measures are really important. And I'm not a quant scholar, 
But I think that we can only identify a gap and identify how we apply an intervention and make things better when we know where when we know where the gap is. Otherwise, we're sort of stabbing in the dark. One final point for me. Um, it's a new arena and I'm doing some research with a couple of colleagues on digital inclusion and it's a minefield out there. So things like algorithmic decision making, um, we're talking about things that we can touch, a material artifact, you know, when I go for a job and there's an interview panel and they're assessing me. Um, we've got algorithms that are now doing that and there are people when Manisha spoke about the end user or design thinking and systems thinking as Suzanne also mentioned um, We need to start looking at that world as well because we're not we're not having enough of a conversation And we're sort of missing out on who's making those decisions and the implications of those decisions um, So yeah, there's some of my ideas about what what for me is success in in the organizational context thank you um it's so fascinating hearing um from all of you and some really practical things in there i'd just like to remind the people listening in um that if they have their own questions that they'd like to ask of any of the panels or all of the panels um to please put them in the chat or the q a because we will have time for those um so Gabrielle, my, yeah, sorry, so, before yeah. you go to another question, can I just, sure. uh, one thing that Demetra said that really interested me, that last piece um, around things like big data and things like technology, one of the things, um, one of my passion projects, one of those things that keeps me up at night at the moment, um, is this idea of how do we learn from different cultures rather than the dominant culture in ways that might help us to tackle some of these issues. And the one that I've been really looking at is um, kind of Gert Hostev's um, cultural dimensions theory and the idea of individual and collectivist cultures. So when we think about technology, we're looking for network systems now. We're looking at non-hierarchical systems. And if I think about something like the statement from the heart, I can't imagine any other place where we've had humans interact in relational ways to solve a complex problem. So how do we take that knowledge and wealth and apply it to something like big data and recruitment systems? Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a different way of thinking about these problems, but it's the wealth that cultures and different cultures can bring as insights into technological solutions where, um, you know, if we could do that, how cool would that be? So do you have any um, ways of doing it? Have you thought, like, experience of that or Demetria or Suzanne? Because it is a fascinating question. So I've got a freight train going past me now. I'm not the construction, so sorry about that. <laughs> So for us, it's who comes, who's allowed at the table, who's allowed to be part of the conversation and where does the power sit in that conversation? So if we've got people doing big data, why aren't people who are cultural theorists sitting at that table and why aren't elders at that table and, um, and why aren't, and, and what's the respect, you know, all of those pieces, how do we actually, and, and this is what we do, but how do you create those spaces where actually real interaction happens and real learning happens? I'll shut up now, sorry. No, no, please go on. I was going to invite either of Suzanne or, or Suzanne's come off mute. Do you want to yeah. add to that? Yeah, look, I think it is critically important. And um, um, I'm, I'm working with um, my friend and colleague in the UK around AI in recruitment systems. And a small win that we've had um, over the last uh, year um, is, to, is that at least two of the very, very uh, large uh, organisations have stopped using a product called HireVue that introduced AI uh, in, uh, in recruitment. And um, that's a, a win by um, by at least asking them, or well, show us what's under the bonnet. What are the assumptions of your algorithms and how were they determined? And to your point, Manisha, uh, who was at the table when you uh, decided on um, how those um, algorithms would be scored and ultimately give a person a chance to uh, be economically included uh, or left uh, consigned to daytime television for the rest of their lives. Um, so 
I think um, it is such a story of persistence um, in, in order to create those changes. And, but the timing is now, uh, as we exponentially, partly as a re result of COVID, um, mature our, our technology and our use of technology, um, ensuring that that direction is one which includes the needs of everybody. Uh, is really in, uh, essential. And then helping organisations to be informed about those choices and those decisions of when they introduce AI into their recruitment and selection process and what the outcomes of that might be for, uh, for individuals. But if we go back onto the idea of, um, of cultural competence, I think what the way that I think about it is uh, for organisations to be um, accessible to groups. And so um, just from a principles perspective, anybody from um, any group should be able to have the same experience as the prevailing group. But then we should be able to adjust for individuals. Um, and therein lies the key. So sometimes we can, um, with our organisations help and uh, you know hats off here to, to Sydney University for their investment in their uh, their capability I think they've done a terrific job um, but we also need to um, be personally able to ask the person and that requires some courage so as an individual, when we don't know or we don't understand or we're not sure what to do, to actually front up and say so. And I think that's a real um, hallmark of uh, cultural competence, that we can't know the complexity of uh, cultural or, um, or cultures or um, individuals' identities even more secure um, or, or how to respond to, to people uh, who have a different way of communicating or read differently, etc. So I think we have to um, have a little dose of courage um, and as individuals um, ask the person, um, what is the best way uh, for me uh, to give you written information? Uh, what's the best way for us to um, communicate? What's your communication um, preferences and it's okay to ask people and allow them to tell you and we encourage individual empowerment and we take the pressure off of ourselves so that our brain isn't so concerned about the fear of getting it wrong and we can give our full attention to the individual with whom we're uh, communicating. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, and uh, Dimitri, did you have anything to add to that? You started that little thread off so... Um, and there were lots of questions coming yeah, in. Yeah, I'm just going to go to the questions now, I think, because they kind of link to where you're at. So the first one um, was about, uh, they've thanked you for an insightful panel discussion. Um, and the question is, how do you best champion middle management and senior leadership when the system is not accessible and when middle management often uses the excuse of budget and time? Oh, I, I suppose I should ask one of you to answer it. <laughs> I forgot that bit. I've started reading another question. Sorry, facilitator fail. Um, Manisha, would you like to start? I was actually going to say, um, ask Suzanne if she wanted to take this one because I, I know that she's had to deal with um, questions like this and, and they come up a lot in um, some of the groups that I, I know that I've been at with A&D as well. Thanks, thanks, Manisha. The, the middle management, um, question is, uh, is a great question because we, we describe this as the hamburger problem. And so, you know, the leaders at the top of the organisation uh, understand and have their goals and aspirations. So, you know, they're the, they're the top part of the white fluffy bun. Um, and people in HR and diversity and inclusion, um, uh, they understand too. So they're the bottom part of the white fluffy bun. Um, but it's that tough meat patty in the middle that we call the middle managers that um, uh, are tough to get through. So I, I think there's, um, there's two ways. Obviously, it helps if the organisation's systems and symbols are um, uh, aligned uh, with the, um, uh, the direction which the organisation's going to go. 
But I think the other part is about um, personal leadership and um, I'm trying to understand what are the, uh, the deterrents for a middle manager. So if the deterrent is cost um, or fear, so if it's cost, it's easy to deal with. We can kind of escalate that or, you know, there's government funding when it comes to complex um, uh, uh, workplace adjustments for people with disability. If it's fear, that requires a different treatment. Um, and so, but it does come to knowing whether the challenge is cost or, or whether it's fear. And when I say cost, I mean uh, the cost of extra time. I don't mean necessarily cold, hard cash or the cost of risk, etc. cetera. Um, and so coming back to my earlier thing about asking the person, um, asking the um, uh, middle managers. Now, look, some of course aren't going to, to tell you, um, but mostly in my work, um, over the last um, 27 years or so, I've met so many really, really good people and people who want to do the right thing. And our goal is to help people to um, work out what their, their barrier is and find a solution for that uh, barrier and to make it in, uh, done in a way that reduces their personal risk but enhances their organisational leadership. All of us want to be really great leaders. If we can help someone uh, to be a better leader and um, a better human um, by sharing some of the risk and understanding their concern, then I think that goes, my experience is that that goes a long way uh, to make it easier to make, make progress. Thank you. Um, Demetria, do you have anything to add to that? question um yeah no thanks gabriel and thank you suzanne um in 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 my experience when i go into organization cost and it's usually the financial rather than the non-financial tends to be the the key issue when it comes to it creating change when it comes to implementing particular interventions for for uh, greater cultural inclusion um, I think I like the white fluffy bun analogy. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I'm seeing increasingly after having done research in this area for a couple of decades now is we need to start having a greater conversation um, with, with, with top leadership. We, we need to start having a conversation about who, who are the role models that we're seeing up there? Why isn't that diversity represented up there? Why isn't it represented in the middle? Um, and once it is, I think that that will by nature of who is in there, who's representing the various groups, will make it an easier sell in inverted commas because that usually is the way that organisational um, stakeholders respond when there is something that can be sold to the various broader incumbents. Um, but I think that we need to start having this conversation about that middle and there is a bit of a movement about managing through the middle. Um, what I find in organisations is that there is a diversity in that middle layer and then it stops. Um, so is there, it, it, it's what Suzanne mentioned, is there a fear or is it a cost? And I find that that middle tends to leave at a particular point. There is an exit point in that talent pipeline and that in itself raises issues. And that could be the fear of wanting to push the boundaries because I can't see myself up there. So how do we change it? I think we need to start having a firmer discussion with leadership, um, that, that the top part of the white fluffy bun and to hold them to account. Um, I think that that's a way that we can, you know, change things and, and push the boundaries to change things. Um, but it is a heavy burden, I think, for the middle to be carrying it on their own. So we, again, it's that conversation with, the people who hold the purse strings and who, who have that non-financial reputational, um, I suppose, impact that they, that, they can, that they can promote 
to the organization more broadly. Thank you, Manisha. Um, you're off mute, so. Oh. No, you're off mute. No, you're... <laughs> Do you want me to, I, I just noticed there were a few questions. Did you want me to answer this yeah, question? I was going to lead, um, yeah. well, I was going to lead into one of the questions because it yeah, seems sure. like a really nice time um, and, and it kind of flows on from what um, you've all been saying. But um, this one's from Annabelle um, and she also says it's a fantastic discussion and relates to um, who is at the table having these conversations and says, from her observation, those who work within DNI roles, teams, functions, etc., often seen as an HR related function which ironically limits who can be part of this work conversation. So the question is, how do we open up um, those involved in this work to include those from a much broader cross-section of experience and professional backgrounds, et cetera? Okay, so there's a really great exercise to do for anyone who's got this question. Grab pen and paper and write down, how don't we do it? Okay, because we know how we don't do That's it. it. We don't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's as easy as that. So if you go, this is what we don't do. This is how we currently work. How, what, what don't we do? Or think about um, the worst engagement option or experience you've ever had. What did you do in that? Or what did, you know, what did you see or have happen? Write down what you don't do and then look at ideating how you can change that across to what you should do or you want to do. So, um, and the reason I say it this way is every, I, I, you know, I can give you sort of a more generic answer, but my guess is, Annabelle, that there's actually something that you've got something in your mind or an experience or an area. And so each area, especially in something as broad as a university, it can be different in different areas. But if we look at, and we often basically just say, who's got a seat at that table? You know, um, and then when you say who has got a seat, it's very easy then to go, who, well, then who doesn't have a seat? Um, and for the, those people on the call, the really easy things to think about is age, gender, culture, ability, um, literacy, uh, education level, and go, okay, well, who's, who's not here? Whose voice aren't we hearing? Uh, once you know whose voice you're not hearing, that's the hardest part of this. In, um, so people often think the hardest part is engaging with people. Actually, the hardest part is re recognising where the gap is. And then the next step is actually going, okay, well, where do we find those people? And um, so what we, we do is we build very strong connections and networks with organisations um, that represent people. And we never invite the representative along. We ask the representational organisations um, to find us people who are passionate about this area, who have been long time excluded from this area. Um, and that's how we get those people. We have this lovely story from um, um, a department. It was a government department in one of the states looking at trains and they had a workshop and it was facilitated and it was all about changing um, the train system and the facilitator actually stopped at one point and said hang on how many people in this room catch a train every day and are on a train every day for more than an hour and of course no one was and so they walked out of the room and they actually just open office who's on the train for more than an hour well the PA was she lived further away um, so they brought her into the meeting transformed it so I think the first step is recognizing who's not in the room um, there's another answer if you ever want it um, around woke organizations and our woke meter which is really where the DNI where people have conversations around DNI is it with HR is it a policy is it HR is it with your manager or your team member who can make a difference Okay, so when you have things embedded in a team and a team can make a difference, you're higher up on the woke scale. The woke scale. I love it. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, Demetria or Suzanne, do you want to have anything to add to that question? Or should we move on to a new one? Yeah, okay. Um, so the next one is from Dan Willis. Um, outside of embedded assumptions and automated processes, how are you helping organisations with interpretation of the results? Data interpretation for decision making is another challenging area with unconscious biases and framing. Suzanne's hot off the press with that. Yeah, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's probably something that everybody uh, on this panel is really deeply interested in. And it, and it goes back to um, Manisha's comment about whose voices are we hearing um, and, um, and 
uh, how, are, how are we hearing them? Uh, so sometimes when we work with organisations, um, the, the conversation might start off with, we know we have more employees with disability here, but they're not telling us who they are and they, they won't fill in their form. Um, and so that's a great kind of indicator of uh, uh, our belief system uh, about, I really want that data, give me the data. Um, and so part of, I think, the sophistication is uh, considering all the uh, areas of interest that we should be gathering to give us uh, a more complete uh, feedback loop on the organisation uh, and how, it, how its cultural competence may be progressing uh, from, a, from a group perspective and from an individual perspective. And so I think the, the answer lies in having some objective measures like um, Manish kindly uh, mentioned our access and inclusion index, thank you. Um, but that means diddly squat um, without um, employees having a voice uh, at the table and employees having someone to trust and speak to that is not HR or not uh, DNI, no disrespect to either HR or DNI, but someone who can cut through and find the influencers and find the change makers who can quickly uh, uh, create uh, results. And so in the organisations that we work with, we uh, encourage executive champions uh, to be uh, really good listeners, uh, to open up listening opportunities to groups, but also to individuals. Um, and to uh, really learn the skill of listening deeply for what they are hearing, but what they're not hearing. And then influencing their, their colleagues uh, with real stories about the impact of uh, being left out or um, away, being kept away from uh, the decision-making table when it might impact their uh, their day-to-day -day, day work. Being excluded is a horrible experience. Uh, it makes us all feel smaller. And so we've got to find systems within our organisation through uh, employee resource groups, uh, through executive champions, uh, through DNI working together as what we call the magic three. Um, to really power up um, the change process and to create deep understanding of the experience of exclusion so that it does cause some discomfort, but really it can be a catalyst for change. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple more questions. So to make sure that we get through them, I'm gonna um, skip to the next one. Um, so this one's for you, Demetria. Um, you mentioned benchmark in the, and it's from Shandana, sorry. Um, you mentioned benchmark in the context of cultural competence. Could you please expand on that as it seems to be a rather difficult concept to implement in practice? Did you say Shanda? Um, Shandana, yeah. Shandana. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much for the question. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more and I've been really privileged to be in terms of setting benchmarks for cultural competence. I've been really privileged to be leading the team where we're developing a cultural competence rubric um, to embed in our graduate qualities. Um, and that's been happening over the course of the last two years. And yes, it is an incredibly difficult um, but exciting process. And so far we've been, I think we've been doing okay. But how do you benchmark cultural competence? Um, <laughs> As we know, cultural competence is, is a, it's a process and it isn't just a once-off event. You don't measure it, um, you evaluate it. So it, you get, as Manisha said from the very beginning, none of us are good at it. None of us have, have excelled at it or have achieved it. It is a process and it's, for me, it's a way of being self-reflective and of being a good observer of what, as we've said, as, as both Suzanne and Manisha have said, 
who is at the table, whose voice is being heard, who is telling the, the stories, who has power, who has privilege. Um, so for me, it's not really setting up a, a, a measure and a benchmark as such, but it's providing someone with the cues to evaluate where they're at on this scale. So as opposed to cultural diversity, which is what we're setting up benchmarking for, which is a little bit easier to measure, for cultural competence, we're not setting up measures, we're setting up um, an evaluation process of how competent am I? <laughs> how competent am I getting? And for me, it's not about saying, well, I have gold standard, I'm now competent. It's about, as I said, having that ability to call my bias out, um, to note what assumptions are influencing how I come at a decision and to be brave enough to have those conversations. I think it, it's what Suzanne also mentioned before about being a little bit uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable within an Australian context talking about race, for instance. Um, we need to have those uncomfortable conversations and it is a process. So is it a benchmark? No, um, it's, it's a process of development. And if we could set up a rubric in organisations, I think that would be really neat. Um, it's hard enough within graduate qualities, but we're getting there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a measure. I don't think we can measure it. I think we can become better at it, but we, we're not really measuring it. So I hope that's answered Shandana's question. Thank you. And this will probably be the last question before we um, just go around all three of you and get a last comment. But um, this is from Fiona Martin. It's, and she asks, recently Chinese students have been telling staff that their choice of readings or discussion material is biased because it conflicts with CPP government positions on political process, democracy or human rights. How can we gracefully, ethically and safely negotiate cultural differences in these instances? So I've been looking at this question for a while um, because it's it's one I've been thinking about in a number of ways. It's everything from this to if someone tells me that they don't want to shake my hand because I'm a woman, do I shake their hand or not? You know, like, so I think there is this piece about when our cultures collide. If it was me, the things I'd be thinking about is first of all, accepting that they're right, that our work is biased. Um, it's biased towards an Australian way of thinking, an Australian way of life and an Australian paradigm. So um, they're not wrong in saying that it's biased towards our way of, of living. So I guess the first thing is to accept that and to be transparent about that, that, you know, the choice of readings are biased towards an Australian academic theory of what we need to read to able, be able to understand this subject. And that's what they're kind of paying for in a way. So, um, and if in their conversations, in their uh, um, arguments, in their essays, they want to bring up um, a different or an alternative viewpoint, well, then I'm assuming that that's not a problem. Uh, it's about being able to critically um, understand and read something and understand that the perspective that we have is actually our perspective. Um, and one of the interesting exercises, if people are interested, is um, there's an exercise around looking at heroes and villains who gets to tell stories. So if you ask people who your heroes are um, um, and your villains are, it's very easy to then look at where your history and your historical perspective comes from and where we've learnt that from and how our education system biases us towards a particular viewpoint of history. So does who's won the war. Um, and the war in this country is different to the war in, in China. So rather than getting into a discussion about who's right and who's wrong, I think the conversation um, needs to be about accepting that we have different views, but actually this is, what, this is where our view comes from and it's okay, it's different. Thank you. Now, I'm conscious of the time. Um, we've got less than five minutes left and I know people have things to go to. Um, so I'm going to invite, uh, first of all, I'm going to invite the panellists to just read Liz Gray's um, comment on chat so that uh, I don't read it out. Um, but also just um, a quick whip around. Um, 
your last thoughts, if you had one piece of advice to give to our participants who are all undergoing the leadership program, the culturally competent leadership program, um, what would it be and how to best engage and approach and embed cultural competence in their work? Um, let's start with you, Suzanne, in case we uh, run out of time. Um, yes, thank you. Look, I think we have to see it as a, as a human um, uh, characteristic and, and just uh, as a personal leadership and how we treat others. And um, back to Manisha's point, it's okay not to know uh, what to do in a, in a certain situation and to know that there are uh, differing uh, views but I think as a matter of um, living and working respectfully, we should ask the person about uh, their, their preferences and then really listen to those preferences. And if we do that, it'll just make life easier for everybody because, you know, the principles that we, that, um, we really um, uh, promote in uh, the Australian Network on Disability, um, is never make any assumptions about anyone, ever. Um, and to always ask the person uh, about their uh, preferences. And then finally, uh, is to always remember uh, that a person's disability or indeed any other cultural aspect um, is as unique as their thumbprint. Um, and as a, a, an individual may uh, present uh, with a particular identity to you, but that may not be their identity that they feel. And so if we stick to those three principles, I think we'll do okay. Brilliant, thank you. Demetria. The unmute button, it needs to be an easier way. <laughs> Thanks, Gabrielle, and thank you, Suzanne. I, I, I think, yes, yeah, so a human-centred approach is really important. I think accountability is also really important. Um, having measures is important and transparency is important. Um, holding ourselves to account as much as we hold our leaders to account is also really important. So, again, it's that, that multi-scalar approach to how we view these issues. Thank you. And last word to Manisha. Not too sure how to answer this. So I'm going to leave you with my three favourite things to do in workshops. The first one is um, we ask three questions. They come out of the inclusive playground movement and they work for everything. It's can I get there? Can I play? Um, can I get there? Can I play there? Can I stay there? So can I get there is how to, can I actually get to you know, can I access it? Can I play there is, have I got the tools to do whatever it is? And can I stay there is, do I feel safe? Do I feel comfortable and at home? So they really work for me. The next lot are actually, um, is it win-win or win-lose? We talk about this with our kids all the time, but I think we forget this as we become adults. So what's a win-win conversation look like? And the last is that we often create um, safe spaces. So when we think about trauma, we think about, is this a safe space? Um, the next one I'd like to bring in there, and um, Suzanne alluded to this, is, is this a courageous space? How can we be safe and courageous at the same time? Thank you. Um, I'm very aware of the time, and I know that Suzanne has another two o'clock um, one to go to, so I'm going to wrap it up there very quickly. Thank you all very, very much. It's been fantastic. Um, so many great insights and really practical ways to approach this. Really appreciate it. And the diversity of experiences that you bring um, to this program and so on. And you can see from the chat line that uh, everybody's agreeing. So um, thank you for making the time to be with us and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.